So I've been using Blender for 5 years and I have learned a lot since I was a beginner. Today I would like to share some insights with you. I would like to show you some tricks and tips that helped me a lot with my work and saved me a days of my time. You will know all these tricks and tips that if you implement them to your workflow, you will work and perform more professionally. By the way, all these tips are not for a specific thing, but all of them are equally important. So anyone who uses Blender can use them. Volumetrics is one of the best ways how you can add depth to your renders. Volumetric shaders doesn't have a surface. Instead, they simulate how the light rays scatters, absorbs and transmits inside the medium. The most simple way how we can add the volume to your render is by adding a cube, make it bigger so it covers the whole scene, or you can use this shader for the world settings. Another reason why you should use volumetrics is that they can make your renders more cinematic. And there are many reasons for this. The first one is that you can use a volume to set a certain color of the scene, which means that you can set a certain mood with your render. Basically it works as a color filter. Another reason why volumetrics can make your renders more cinematic is that it will create that cool glare effect around all the light sources which makes the render look more interesting. And finally, it can save you from making background. Because when you use volume, the objects that are further from the camera will gradually disappear behind the volume. Now, the only downside is that volumes take more samples and time to render. So if you want to have alternative option, you can use a mist pass, which is a render layer that will extract depth information of the scene and convert it into black and white texture that you can use in the compositor as a substitution for the volumetrics. The ambient occlusion in Blender is a very underrated feature. Most people don't use this feature because they don't know how or they even don't know about this feature. A simple explanation for ambient occlusion is that it's a shading technique which darkens creases, corners and nearby surfaces to simulate soft shadowing caused by indirect lighting being blocked. This means that you can use ambient occlusion to bring two or more objects together, as you can see here on this example, where I used ambient occlusion node to create that crunch, which is pretty common when you look on reference images. To make it more random, you can add a noise texture and combine it with the ambient occlusion with a linear light operation. You can also bake the ambient occlusion data to a texture, so you can export it or use the same data on different objects. Ambient occlusion is also very common for games, because it adds to realism and it's faster to to calculate and you can calculate it in the real time. In fact, ambient occlusion is so helpful, it can speed up your rendering in cycles up to three times, which can be done if you go to the render properties, go to light paths and enable fast GI approximation. This feature uses ambient occlusion as an alternative way how to calculate indirect lighting, which takes most of the time when you use ray tracing. You can also add more light bounces to make it more realistic. And if you ever used PBR materials, you know that most of these materials also have ambient occlusion map. This map basically adds some micro shadows and it's usually combined with the color map. By multiplying the color map with the ambient occlusion map, by using a multiply operation on the color mix node. If you ever used PBR materials, you know that once you tile them too many times, you will get this unnatural repeating tile pattern. However, this can be easily solved with a combination of different methods and a few nodes. I made this custom anti-tile node group, which works as alternative option for the traditional mapping node. You can get this node group on my Gumroad page. I'm going to leave the link in the description under this video. Another way how we can hide this repetition is by using a combination of multiple materials. For example, you can use two different ground textures and blend them with a mixed shader node by using a custom in-painted mask or you can use a noise texture. And the last way how we can hide the repetition is again by using procedural textures like noise to randomize the value and the saturation of the texture. This way you will randomize the brightness of the color map, which can make the material look patternless. Now this might be a controversial take, but if you want to be a great 3D artist and you would like to work with clients as a freelancer, you will most likely need to use assets from time to time. The reason for that is when someone hires you, they are either paying for your time or for your work. So if you are for example working on a complex project or a large environment scene, you don't have to make everything by yourself. Because first, it will be too expensive for the clients to hire you. And second, it will take a very long time. And instead working a few days, you can spend weeks or even months finishing the project. Now, I'm not saying that it's worthless to know how to do everything, because if you are a good 3D artist, you should know how to model things, how to use textures, how to light objects, how to properly render, and everything about it. 
But if you take a look on the industry and analyze your competitors, almost everybody is using AI for certain tasks. Whether it's a 3D modeling, texturing, animating, compositing, or anything else, it's very hard to compete and find your place in the market if you don't use this technological advantage. If you want to make realistic lighting in Blender, using environment textures is probably the best way to go with. These environment textures are called HDRIs, which stands for High Dynamic Range Images. These images are special 360 degrees images that store much wider range of brightness than a standard photos. That's why you can find most of these images in the EXR or HDR format, because they can store much wider dynamic range than formats like JPEG or PNG. Now, there are a bunch of free online libraries where you can get these environment textures, but essentially when you download one, you will need to go to the shader editor, go to world option, and you will need to add environment texture node. Then if you load the texture to the node and plug it to the background, you will now have a realistic lighting with a realistic background for your scene. And this is very important for several reasons. Because you are not only getting lighting from all different angles, but you will also get a realistic reflections from one single image. Just this one feature will make your renders way more realistic than before. The second important advantage of environment textures is that you can get a free background without modeling it manually, which can add to the storytelling because sometimes it's way better to have something in the background than blank solid color. Now if you also add a mapping node and connect it with the environment texture, you can also control the rotation, which can help you to experiment with different lighting angles and find the best lighting for your scene. There is also a sky texture that can be used for the same thing, where again you can have more control about the settings like the location of the sun, the composition of the atmosphere and much more. But the sky texture is not that much realistic, however I would still recommend using HDRI textures since they are more complex and they also look more realistic. Drivers in Blender Drivers are probably the most underrated feature that most Blender artists don't even use. With drivers you can use a specific property to control or animate multiple properties at once. For example, when you have a brick texture, there are some properties that you cannot control outside of the node because they don't have any input sockets. But what if I want to control this property from the node group? But there is no way how can I connect the node group to the property. Well first, you need to make sure that you are using the same data type, which you can set in the side panel in the shader editor. Then you will copy the data path of the property, open the node group, go to the brick texture and add a new driver. This will create a new temporary window. And if you accidentally move your cursor and the window disappears, you can go back by clicking on edit driver. Now first, set the type to some values, then change the variable to single property. Now the property that we want to use is a property, which is part of the node group, inside a material. So we will select the material as the property. Then we will select the material that we are using. And finally, you will paste the data path that you copied from the property in this little box that just appeared. And now we can control the property from the outside of the node group, even though the property doesn't have any input. Another example of how drivers can be useful in animations is that you can control multiple objects with one single property. I use this method in this project, where I made this deconstruction effect animation which looks pretty complex, but the only thing that I did was that I created a driver, which basically tells Blender, if I move this object on a certain axis, this object will move on the z-axis, and it will move the same distance, which can be then multiplied by a certain offset, which you can see here in this box. And the best way is that you can copy this driver, and you can just paste it on other objects. So you don't have to create a new driver for each object. When you are using any type of motion in Blender, make sure that there is some variation and imperfection in the movement. This is because by default, when you set keyframes, often the animation is linear by default. Now, linear animation can work in some cases. For example, when you are animating a car with a constant movement. But the problem with linear motion is that it often looks boring and unnatural. It's very common for motion graphics to add some transitions or some variation in the acceleration. So if you want to make your renders more interesting, make sure to use a Bezier curve. When you are working in the graph editor, you can select the keyframes, go to the modifiers and add a noise modifier. This is a great way how to simulate a handheld movement because you can apply it or basically any object is good for storytelling and it's more engaging for the viewer since the motion is more randomized and doesn't feel artificial. So when it comes to modeling, especially to hard surface modeling, it is very important to maintain high quality topology. 
Topology is basically the mesh that constructs your 3D object and it's made out of three fundamental elements, words, edges and faces. And even though all these three elements are equally important, the face is actually the element that forms the polygonal area and fills the space. Now, there are three common types of faces, triangles, quads, and n-gons. Every face type has its own advantages and disadvantages. But if you should pick one which is probably the most useful, it should be the quads topology. And there are many reasons for this. The first reason is that the quads topology is the easiest topology to work with, because it's organized, so it makes selecting face loops easier. You can also run edge loops, and when you subdivide quad topology, it subdivides very well because the quad topology is predictable, and it splits the face into four smaller even quads. It's also commonly used in animation, since quads are deforming better than triangles or end cons. It also makes marking seams and unwrapping much easier, since it's easy to select edge loops. So if I have to summarize this, when you have two identical 3D objects, it's much easier to work with this model than with this model, because with this model, it's far more easier to make any adjustments. Now, if you have a mesh and your topology looks like this, there are two ways how you can fix the topology in Blender. The first way is by using a remesh option, which you can find in the object data properties. You will select your object that you want to remesh. You will choose the remesh option. You will change some settings, including the voxel size. You will set what resolution do you want, and you will click remesh. The second option is by using a remesh modifier, which in my opinion produces way better results, because you can choose from more options, and it's a non-destructive way. The reason why topology is important is because the topology determines the usability of the mesh. Now, it happens that sometimes you just cannot use the quad topology. For example, if you are sculpting and you need to use the dynamic topology tool, then in that situation, the topology doesn't really matter. However, when you are done with sculpting and you would like to apply some image textures, you will need to unwrap the mesh first, which is pretty hard when your topology looks like this. Did you know that there is an easy way how you can track cameras or lights to any object you want? This is very helpful if you want to for example keep one object centered in the camera or when you want the light to always face the object. And the easiest way how you can do this is by using a track to constraint. First you will select the object, then go to constraints and add track to constraint. Now you will select the target object to which the object should be tracked to. It's pretty simple and if it doesn't work Try applying transforms, or you can try switching different axes. So there is a way how you can make your renders more cinematic, just with one single node. First, render your scene. Then go to compositing, enable use nodes, and add RGB curves node, and plug it to the node group. Now, to make the render more visually appealing, we will create an S-curve, which means that we will make the highlights brighter and the shadows darker. And as the cherry on the top, we will take the absolute highlights and absolute shadows, and we will bring them a little bit closer together. This will make the render look a little bit less contrasty, but in my opinion, it looks a little bit more visually appealing. Now, if you don't want to deal with texture tiling, there is an alternative way how we can apply materials to your objects, and that is procedural shading. Unlike shading with PBR materials, procedural shading is entirely node-based, and it's all done directly in Blender, which means that the entire material is made in the shader editor. With this method, you have a complete freedom over the appearance of the material, because you can fully customize any property that the material has. Another big advantage that procedural shading has over traditional PBR shading is that the resolution of the materials is fully adjustable, which means that your materials can basically have unlimited resolution, unlike with PBR materials, where the resolution is strictly determined by pixels. Now, I can probably say that I have mastered this skill, to the point where I'm making procedural materials that are fully realistic and can be easily customized by the user. I recently released an add-on with over 100 of these materials, so if you want to get it, you can either click on the link which appeared in the top right corner, or you can find it under this video, it is the first link in the description. I'm gonna show you how you can add a story and detail to your renders and make your scene overall more interesting just with one single texture. You might have heard about it before. It's called Gobos, and it's a lighting technique that uses textures to create dynamic shadow patterns and to make your renders feel more alive. First, you need a Gobos texture, which you can find online pretty easily, because it is just a black and white texture. Alternatively, you can use a procedural texture like noise, but the appearance won't be as realistic as if you would use a realistic Gobos texture, which contains a silhouette of a certain object. Then you will apply the texture on the plane and plug the alpha to the alpha. 
If you don't have an alpha mask, you can use the color output too, since it's already black and white. Again, there are many reasons why gobos can improve your renders. First, it adds a story and detail to your renders. Here you can see comparison with two renders, one with and one without gobos. The reason why the one with the gobos looks better is because the gobos can add context to your scene, and it can heavily contribute to the storytelling. Another reason why gobos is very popular is that it adds animated element or movement to your render. Because you don't have to use a static texture, you can also use a video, or you can animate a procedural texture, which can make the render look more believable. And finally, gobos works very well with volumetrics, since you can easily make god rays, which is a pretty cool effect to have. So here were some of my tips, which helped me a lot in my professional Blender career. If you want to have similar videos in the future, subscribe to my YouTube channel, comment what you think, and make sure to leave a like. Also check out my new add-on called ShadeGuard, which I already mentioned in this video. It's a library of over 100 procedural materials, ready to be used for any project. All materials are fully customizable, with unlimited resolution, and can be animated. So if you are interested, is the first link in the description, and I'm gonna see you in the next video. See you there.